Good afternoon. Welcome and thank you all for joining in on the webinar. I want to just start by reviewing a little bit of what we talked about last time and then going right into my focus for today. Last time we talked about couples and eating disorder and the focus was on the outline at the beginning of the workshop which was if you remember, we talked a little bit about relational therapy in general and how much work, you know, there's three major leaders in the field these days. There's Gottman's work on marriage clinic, which was fantastic. And there's Susan Johnson uh, and her contributions to couples therapy, which have been terrific. Uh, and there's always Harville Hendricks's work. I think the three of them have really revolutionized relational therapy and now we want to do is apply that to eating disorders work. I think what is different in our focus is with eating disorder clients we see there to be a difficulty in the area of attachment and difficulty in the area of self-differentiation and then some difficulties with boundaries and being able to care for self and others. And so we talked about that very much last time. And then secondly, we talked about partner choice. And I wanted to start with that today and then really talk about what to do with partners. You know, with eating disorder, there are two different types of partner choices. There's a destructive partner choice where the point I made in the first webinar was that the data suggests that oftentimes eating disorder clients who are married have a poorer prognosis than those who aren't. And why might that be? And I think the answer to that is that sometimes the eating disorder helps make the partner choice. And so clearly the partner could be an enabler and could be slightly threatened by the fact that the client is recovering. And so as the client begins to make radical changes in their life on the map of recovery, the partner has to begin to accommodate that. So let's talk about that uh, as you turn to partner choice on your outline. And the first slide, which is slide number 20, would be the assumptions regarding relationships and I think I talked about this last time from Freeman's work in 1992 in marriage therapy. He said that really the problems that most people present in marital therapy are not necessarily the problem that needs to be addressed and that for most people they have what's called unfinished business which is a present emotional reaction is shaped by a past experience. It's a reactive response guided by strong emotional feelings based upon the past experience of anxiety. Unfinished business doesn't allow for a thoughtful, creative response to a here and now situation. It triggers instead an emotional reactive response. Who we bring into our life, and this is what I like, who we bring into our life, our major life decisions, how we embrace important people, and the amount of closeness and distance we need emotionally all shape unfinished business carried into adult life. You know, yesterday I had a woman come into my office and she said, you know, my husband, he's not been emotionally close to me. We don't talk about things. He's not emotionally close to the kids. He has been cross-dressing him regularly. And, um, you know, we have a very distant relationship. And I said, so, you know, why are you in my office? What, what is it you need from me? Because the question to ask yourself is why you've been willing to tolerate this for the number of years that you have. And, you know, what's the emotional congruence between the two of you that would make you stay in a relationship where you're getting so little for so long? And, you know, the similar kind of thing could be asked in eating disorder cases, which is why has the partner allowed themselves to stay in a relationship where they've been getting so little so long? Because clearly, for so many eating disorder clients, what they're doing is 
they're getting their primary needs met through the eating disorder and their partner becomes secondary or their kids become secondary and the partner becomes tertiary. And why would a partner allow themselves to have a tertiary relationship? And that's obviously the question. So as that changes in the eating disorder work, what you want to be able to do is get the partner more involved. And so what's optimal for us at Castlewood is that we want to involve the partner in the therapy as much as possible and help them understand you know that the eating disorder has come to protect the individual it's a it's a way that the partner is used over a long period of time to stay safe and to maintain some control so when they realize that they can become part of the recovery process so um, what we, I did in the next slide, which is H slide 21, is I picked this quote from Masterson, and this is a great book, this Masterson and Klein book on disorders of self. And in that, what he says is that the extension of intrapsychic conflict on the stage of the outer world often manifests itself in interactions with others. It can't be strictly called interpersonal because they're essentially extensions of the individual's problems from the past. These problems are played out using one another, not as his or her real self, but an involuntary actor cast in a role that the patient repeats in the present in order to avoid past memories and feelings. What that means is that what happens is, is that the individual picks the partner almost like um, someone to project unfinished business from the past onto. And then what happens in those scenarios is just kind of a a replay or you know kind of like a a flashback. And over and over again they repeat these things. And so particularly in cases where there's been abuse or trauma in the past, there's this concept of reenactment and repetition. Now, I want to talk about that in some depth today because I want to be talking to you about individuals who are both hyposexual and hypersexual. Now, we're seeing in the vast majority of cases of binge eating disorder concomitant sexual compulsive behavior. Oftentimes, the client will not define themselves as a sex addict. They just know that they're binging on food is similar to their binging upon partners for sex. And they're doing behavior which is outside their own value system and feels shameful and contributes to their self-hate. And this is similar to what Masterson is talking about, which is a reenactment. So let's talk about that. The reenactment is not only about when they're having sex with someone, they do it out of two reasons. One is caretaking. So a partner, for example, um, they'll see someone who needs to be taken care of, and they'll want to have sex with them as a way of taking care of them. Or they find a partner who um, is somehow related to their own loneliness and emptiness inside. And so they have sex with a partner because it makes them feel wanted or desired if the partner will have sex with them. So it's, it's really for non-sexual purposes. They don't feel turned on by the partner. They don't feel sexually aroused by the partner. They're not a partner that they would like to have a love or romantic relationship with. The partner is someone that fills their own emptiness. So if you want to parallel, it would be like a client who comes in with binge eating yesterday says to me, well, I had this feeling in my stomach of emptiness and loneliness. And I use that as a cue to binge. And I think that what I need to do 
is become metacognitional with that and realize that when I get that signal from my stomach, it doesn't necessarily mean that I want food. It means that I'm having emotions and feelings. So often then, it's an affect regulation and dysregulation issue. The person has been unaccustomed to identifying emotions and using emotions as signal states. And so when they're lonely, they eat. When they're scared, they eat. When they're jealous, they eat. When they feel um, that it's 10 o'clock at night and they particularly would like to have someone care about them, they eat. In a very similar way with sex addiction, those same feelings in the body result in, I want a partner for sex. So as they get under control of the binge eating disorder, the sex addiction can become bigger and they want to act out on it in a variety of ways. If you add to it this Masterson quote, oftentimes there's a repetition that somehow when they were a child and they were lonely and they were scared, instead of turning to their caretakers for comfort and soothing, they turn to food for comfort and soothing. And uh, sometimes they, if they were being sexually abused, they turned to their abuser and so it became both necessary and distressing. And so the food and the partner become both necessary and distressing, which then makes it an object for sexual or eating disorder um, kind of satiation. So they turn to food or they turn to sex or they turn to relationships as both necessary and distressing. And therefore, what one wants to do is to begin to help them find something to comfort and soothe themselves that might be working. It's called And what happens is that just like in attachment, we turn to another person for a source of comfort when you're, when you're attached. What happens is, is that in this both necessary and distressing polarization, what happens is that men, for example, become both dangerous and a source of comfort. And food becomes a source of comfort and yet a source of pain and agony. Or they have this core schema where they have to believe that people hurt them, but they're also necessary. So in Jeffrey Young's concept of schema therapy, what we do is we have them look at these core schema, and I think there are 18 that Jeffrey Young spells out. And then as we look at these core schema and they get activated, what we have them do is form a schema card, as Jeffrey Young specifies, and to look at how these schema get laid out in early life and how the schema then become both necessary and distressing as part of the intimacy polarization. So in this next slide, what I try to do is it becomes almost addictive. And so this is a quote from one of the clients that I saw in the past. She says, as a child, I would lock myself in the bathroom and play with dolls the way I had been touched. One would be in bed and the other would fondle him or her. I couldn't understand why I did this or where it came from. I was ashamed of the awareness but couldn't help acting it out. I thought the shame belonged inside me, but the awareness was solely created from me. During the teenage years, I turned to boys to duplicate some of those feelings of being cared for and loved. I knew I was fooling myself, but I felt the emptiness I was left with after my liaison with boys was all I had, and a desperate need to feel loved. To kneel affection was so great, I couldn't say no to many people, and I rarely did. Then she said, do you know why at the ages of eight, 18 I had my tubes tied? Because whenever I thought of myself around my child, 
mental image would always appear. The image was clear, and I believed in it certainly. I saw myself not being able to control the thing that lived in me from you, meaning the molester. I saw myself fondling sexually my own infant. I find this quote particularly powerful because it really lays out this reenactment concept. And so often in people's sexual and erotic fantasies, or what John Money called their love map, they see themselves repeating or reenacting some of this unfinished business from childhood. So what happens is, is that the person feels lonely or feels empty and then pictures themselves um, using some substance or using some food or using sex as a way of somehow filling that emptiness. And so that love map needs to be spelled out. And as it does, then you need to kind of what Adler calls spit in the soup, which means that that fantasy that gets laid in in childhood needs to be looked at. And the person needs to find an alternative coping response for the emptiness, for the loneliness, and begin to use people as a source of comfort as opposed to using food or using sex or using relationships to fill the emptiness in some ways. So in this next slide, I show a picture of one of the monkeys that I worked with back years ago from Harlow's lab. And I think some of you remember that my early career was spent working with some of the isolate monkeys, the rhesus monkeys. It changes the way you think. And it was pretty dramatic because this was called a motherless mother monkey. And what happened is, is that these monkeys were deprived in childhood of peer relationships and mother comfort. And what would happen is that these motherless mother monkeys, when they got impregnated, would go in and kill their infants. And that's what this is a picture of. And we had to go in and pull this baby out before the mother would hurt it. And when we studied this a lot in the monkeys, what we found is that the monkeys would become intensely fearful and when they were fearful, they would become hyper-aggressive and then hurt the infant. And in humans, the parallel of this is, is that there, whenever an individual has been sexually abused, they're physiologically dysregulated. They have changes in their serotonin system, their dopamine system, their noradrenaline system, and the cortisol system. And as these monkeys become dysregulated or the humans become dysregulated, their emotional system is way out of whack. And so what happens is just that they become hyperreactive and end up hurting uh, in this case. But with humans, they become rageful or angry at times and out of control, impulsive. And that then results in their wanting to fill that physiological dysregulation with food or with sex or with relationships. And so the key thing is to get them adequately medicated, which is not easily, and to get them adequately diagnosed. And there are so many SSRIs these days that finding the right one with the right side effect spectrum is so critical. And as that happens, then they become killed in some ways. So. With trauma survivors, they have symptoms rather than they have memories. They're shown in side 25. And I just show examples of that from Mary Harvey, where in this way of coping with this hyperreactivity and hyperresponsiveness, they can turn to food or sex as a way of being able to do this. In slide 26, it says the protagonist doesn't know that the performance designed to master events were once too exciting, too frightening, too mortifying to master in childhood. Unable to remember these events, his life is giving up to reliving them in disguised form. Now this seems to me really important because what happens is that with complex trauma, what we're finding is just that individuals 
in their childhood or adolescence end up isolating themselves, spending a lot of time in their bedroom, becoming more and more different than their peers, having social skill deficits that get amplified, and then turn either to food as a solution, either deprivation or compulsive eating. And so as they begin to get better from this and we deal with their food-related behavior, a lot of things happen, which is that, yes, their eating disorder does get better, and we're able to teach them healthy ways of eating and keep them on a food plan. But now, the real issue is how to begin to deal with them in the world. There's so many things they don't know how to do and so many fears that they have that if they don't turn to food, what are they going to be able to do? And so they oftentimes get into relationship difficulties. And that turns out to have part problems with partners. So let's talk about this now in terms of attachments. One of the things I want to talk about is, let's say that a person comes in with an eating disorder and they have a partner. And you do involve the partner in the therapy. There are two things that are going to come up. One is how to eat with your partner and how to have sex with your partner. Those are the two things that I think are really critical. So let's talk about eating first because it relates to, to telling them about sexuality. I think first is the educational aspect of this. What you want to be able to do if you have a healthy partner is to teach the partner what their role is in the recovery process. First of all, they're not a therapist, and you don't want to get them in the role of being the therapist. Two is that they can be a great adjunct at the table, and you would like to encourage them to be able to do that. So for example, first they should come in with a dietitian and find out what the client's meal plan is and learn more about the function of the eating disorder for the client. For so long, the eating disorder has been a source of safety and comfort and has helped the client in so many ways. And so the more that the spouse begins to understand this and understand the function and the purpose of the eating disorder, the more supportive they can be in the process. And that's what you will hope for. I would want the partner to be for example, involved with grocery shopping. And this can take a fair amount of time, but the, the partner would need to understand how fearful the person can be of grocery shopping and to help them become a support and not someone who's going to, you know, kind of take control of the situation. So as they become a source of support, you know, it's the same thing as at the table. What you're hoping for is that, that before the partner comes to the table that there's some discussion and you can be able to say, you know, how are you doing today? Is the eating disorder in control right now? Or are you feeling in control? And, you know, let's talk a little bit about some of your fears before we get to the table. The same thing about a restaurant. If in the meal plan the dietitian lays out that we go to a restaurant once or twice a week, let's talk about which restaurant we're going to go to and your feelings about that and whether the eating disorder is in control, whether you're in control, and you know, what's your commitment to your meal plan and how can I be of support when we are at the meal or when we're at the restaurant or when we're at the grocery store. And so the partner becomes a real adjunct to this process rather than someone who tries to come in and be the therapist or be in control. So the partner is available for pre and for post to discuss how the individual is doing and what their feelings are in the same way the therapist might have been. And then it's really helpful to have someone who's there and, you know, the literature on addiction is always clear that if you're doing this with somebody as a partner, 
um, it's always easier to stop the addictive behavior. So having the partner as an ally is really terrific with this and part of the process. So if you can bring a partner in that, you know, it takes a fair amount of time commitment and emotional commitment. And if the partner is really willing to do that as part of this process, it's great. But if, on the other hand, the partner becomes wanting to be in control and being a therapist and gets angry and frustrated, you know, it's clearly harmful to the partner's process. So you really want to assess whether this partner is really part of the therapeutic plan or and helpful or not. Also, you know, the role of the kids in that process are really important also. Well, in a very similar way, you can think of sex. And as we get into talking about hyposexuality, which we're going to do in a few minutes, it's really important in a very similar way to involve the partner and to be able to have the person talk a little bit about sexuality and hyposexuality and be able to see what the emotional feelings are ahead of time. So we'll get to that. Let's turn now to where you are in the slides, which is on attachments. And so we're on slide number 28. And I give you a Maggie Phillips quote there, which is, secure base with the attachment figure is perceived as available and responsive provides a base for confident exploration. Partnership is a secure base. The relationship is a vehicle for change. Using the relationship to unshackle the client from the legacies of past traumatic experiences by supporting the review of historically dominated internal working models and encouraging new autonomous models to emerge. Now you can see how this quote fits into what we've been talking about. If the partner is a true secure base, then the person can turn to the partner as a source of comfort before the meal and the person can, can turn to the partner as a source of comfort, you know, when they're feeling scared in general. And that partner becomes we against the problem and makes them feel invincible. So, you know, the goal is to help the partner become a secure base in that kind of a way. I use here on slide number 28 P words, which are play, perfectionism, pleasure, and passion. And so much with eating disorder, these words become confusing. I think more on the anorexic side, you get perfectionism, pleasure, and passion problems, and play problems. But honestly, that's true with all eating disorder clients. And so if we include the partner in this, what the partner can do is help lay out a plan each week for how are we going to play? What are we going to do to enjoy ourselves? What are we going to do this weekend to get away from all the have-tos and get into want-tos? So often with the eating disorder client, they feel like they're one of those pinball machines where they're going, where the ball is going from one pin to another, bouncing off from one obligation and responsibility to the next. And so what happens is that the kids and the husband become just another thing that on a to-do list that have to be done. So the goal is to get out of the to-do list and ask oneself in a more spontaneous way, what are we going to do to play and have fun? What's our source of pleasure? And that a person is able to do that on a daily basis. And particularly on weekends, that they're able to do that as a partnership. What are we going to do for fun? If the partner is highly perfectionistic and rigid and obsessive, then they're going to make the problem worse rather than better. So the partner wants to be in recovery from their own obsessiveness and be able to do the same kind of thing, which is what are we going to do spontaneous for fun on a daily basis? Similarly, with perfectionism, to get out of needing to do things well and instead of just do things sometimes just um, in a mediocre kind of way and be able to get joy out of doing things in a kind of C-level fashion. Same thing with passion. I think so often that 
the eating disorder takes over the passion. And so when they begin to let go of that, then what one wants to do is to ask oneself, you know, what's the source of play? What's the source of pleasure? What's the source of passion on a day-by-day -day basis? And I don't know, passion is something that allows you to be able to put your heart into, that gives you joy, that gives you satisfaction. And if you don't have passion, to begin to discover that. I love, you know, looking for hobbies, looking for things that give you great pleasure and joy, and then feeding those passions on a day-by-day -day basis. It's oftentimes helpful for the therapist to provide a model for that. And so in my office, you know, I have lots of flowers and lots of photography and lots of art and lots of plants and lots of natural passions. And so that the client can begin to get some frame of reference of that and can use the therapist as sometimes a help in that process. Now, if you go to the next slide, I have romantic attachment. And that, if you remember in the last discussion, what we talked about was romantic attachment. And there's two styles of attachment. There's the avoidance style, which is the type A, and there's the anxious attachment, which is the type C. And what I said was with eating disorder clients, almost all of them tend to have what are called AC patterns, meaning that they are extreme on avoidant and are extreme on preoccupied attachment, both, which is a highly unusual pattern. So let's talk about the implications of that. With the avoidant attachment, you have someone who's less interested in relationship. They're, you know, they lack passion. They have low satisfaction. And so they don't feel really that interested in relationships. They have very high breakup rates, low intimacy, less falling in love, um, more game playing, less intimate sex. Um, and they oftentimes don't enjoy sex as much. Uh, they don't get as much satisfaction out of it as their partners. When they're adolescent, they have more casual sex, but they don't enjoy it that much. And there's certain perfectionism with sex. And so sometimes there's a lot of performance demands, particularly on the men. On the other side, they can be obsessed with a partner, and particularly when they're lonely, um, they can find themselves highly dependent on a partner. So you can say, well, how can they both be true? And that's what's peculiar. So they become dependent on the partner. They need the partner, have the partner around. And yet at the same time, is they don't really enjoy the partner. So it's a very strange relationship. Um, and they can be obsessive. I need you to love me, even though I don't really love you very much. So what happens is I need to be loved by somebody but it doesn't really matter who it is. I just need to be loved by somebody to feel like I exist. And the reason for that is that they don't have a very cohesive sense of self. And so they need the other as a way of kind of reflecting back that they're alive and that they, are, they do have a self. So what we find is that in order to be able to deal with this, it's really important to do self-cohesion work and to be able to help them begin to have a relationship with self. And they're very concerned with rejection and abandonment. And they get obsessed with the partner whenever they're in that realm. So you get a picture of what they're doing, which is, I don't love you very much, but I need you to love me. And that becomes really difficult for the partner. So the next slide then shows that what happens in relationship is, is that in all relationships, there's going to be disruption of the attachment. People fight. They hurt each other. And for most people, they repair the rupture is relatively quickly. So they fight and they get back together. But for a person with an AC pattern, this disruption of attachment is oftentimes really difficult. So what happens with a therapist, for example, is this that when you fight, meaning that they get mad at you about something, then oftentimes they leave therapy 
or there's a you know they de they're devastated by that, and they don't know how to repair the rupture in that relationship. So a good bit of the therapy needs to be oriented towards teaching people that it is healthy and normal to have disruption of attachment and how to repair that. And so giving them anticipatory guidance of that is really critical in the therapy process. And if they can do it with the therapist, then they can oftentimes do it with partners, and that's really important for insecure attachment. Turning to slide 32, we see the target symptoms for insecure attachment, and this is turning to other people for self-soothing. So let's get back to the eating disorder client and their partner. What we're trying to be able to do is teach them how to have a fight with their partner, which is really important, and how to begin then to repair the rupture with a partner. If they can do it with a therapist, then they can do it with a partner, and giving them practice with that and showing them how to be able to do that is really important. Oftentimes they're afraid of fighting, and so they come in and they say, oh, my partner and I never fight. And of course, that's really a sign of an unhealthy relationship. They have to be not afraid of fighting, learn how to be able to fight, learn how to have ruptures in the relationship, and practice getting back connected to one another and learning how to be able to do that. And oftentimes both partners need practice with that in some ways. So in this target symptoms for insecure attachment, what we're beginning to do is begin to teach the partners how to work as a team and become metacognitional in the way that Gottman talks about. And metacognitional simply means that, you know, if they're having difficulty in the relationship, they can begin to separate from the content and begin to look at the process of how they deal with it in some ways. So if they're dealing with one of the issues of the relationship, let's say they're fighting about the kids, that they can step back from that and be able to say, let's talk about what we're doing right now. We're upset about the kids and about this and this and an issue, but can we somehow stay on the same team and continue to love and care about one another even though we're disagreeing about the way we're dealing with the kids. And that kind of thinking is so helpful because if they can become metacognitional about that, then it becomes easier to stay metacognitional in dealing with other issues uh, in both the therapy relationship and also between each other. And so uh, that becomes really helpful in being able to practice this in some ways, and that's the key to insecure attachment. Now I want to turn now to slide 33, which is the love map, and now I want to begin to deal with a love map of the type A, or the avoidance style, and oftentimes that's the inhibited sexual desire. The inhibited sexual desire is the most common pattern you see among clients who are in the phase of eating disorder where they're oriented more towards restricting. And restricting is tied with isolation and inhibited sexual desire. Even the clients who have hypersexuality eventually move to hyposexuality. So the question is what to do with eating disorder clients who are in a restrictive style with regards to the relationship and are in an avoidance style, meaning that they're turning towards avoiding the partner or having low sexual desire with a partner. Now the answer to that is very similar to the way you deal with food, which is that oftentimes you can't trust your body, and you can't just listen to your body the way other people do. And so we have what's called the french fry phenomena, and it's worth just going into that as an example because it's sort of humorous. and does lay out the parallel, which is the french fry phenomena is that if you eat one french fry or eat one potato chip, it's hard not to eat a second one or a third one. And if you lend yourself to the activity, oftentimes before you know it, you want a whole bag of french fries or you want the whole bag of potato chips. And so 
you lend yourself to the activity and see how it goes. Well, when you have an avoidance style, that's sometimes what you have to do with regards to sex. You want to begin to lend yourself to the activity to nibble and eat a potato chip. And oftentimes when you eat one, you want a second one. The same thing with regards to sex. If you lend yourself to it in some ways and allow yourself to get involved in touching your partner's body for your pleasure. So that's oftentimes where sensate focus comes in. Most of you probably have not had a lot of experience with sensate focus, which is the Masters and Johnson model. So let's go through that again. In sensate focus, what you do is you say to the person, I want you to allow yourself to touch your partner breasts and genitals off limits. I want you to touch your partner from head to toe, front to back, in a sensual way. I want you to notice what you're feeling. Notice what you're experiencing. Become mindful. So what does it feel like to touch the person's hair? What does it feel like to touch the partner's face? What does it feel like to touch the partner's lips? What does it feel like to touch the partner's chest? And as you begin to put labels to that, what you find is that it's a wonderful sensual experience. Well, some people with avoidance style will say, well, what do you mean, what does it feel like? It feels like an impersonal object. Well, remember, you're touching another human being who's alive, who's incredible. The body is an amazing machine. So the therapist wants to begin to get the person passionate and excited by the fact that A, they're touching another human being, B, that the human being's body is the most incredible of all machines, and three, that this is not only a person's body, but this is a person you love. So how is it different than touching something else you love? Sometimes I'll use a parallel of a beautiful rock that I have in my office. And the rock will be purple or green, and it's beautiful. And they're oftentimes more involved with touching the rock than they are another person. So if I can bring the parallel to the rock and say, but this is the person who's alive and a person who's human and this person you love, how is that different than the rock? I can begin to help them begin to put that element into the touch and begin to help them feel more excitement about it in some ways. Well, that's what sensate focus is. You want to begin to help them feel excited about this in some ways and bring it alive. And in that, you take that avoidance style and you begin to humanize it and help them begin as a human being to feel, bring love into it in some ways. You can use transitional objects. Sometimes I'll bring a pet in. How is it different than touching a rock than touching you know, a cat or a dog? And then if they can do that, they can make, it make a transfer to a human being. Well, that's all really valuable and important. And what happens is we're beginning to build the love map and help them begin to open their heart. So you know, what often does I'll have them do is touch their heart. As they touch their heart, I have them then open up their hand and feel the heart energy come out and begin to feel love towards their cat or love towards their dog and then love towards their partner and be able to feel the energy from their body and their heart as they open up their heart to somebody and begin to experience affect and let that affect out. So there's a variety of tools to be able to do that. They often have to love something or somebody. I'll use that as a transitional object and try to help them begin to show love because you know these are natural capacities. You're just opening up that which is they're born with. And the question is, what's closed it? So let's now talk about that. Part is learning to open up. Part is learning how to figure out what closed it. And what happens is that when they're younger, something happens to close their heart to loving and to caring about other people. And in the work that we do in trauma, oftentimes we'll go to the trauma or we'll go to the eating disorder, and we'll ask the eating disorder to tell us a little bit about itself and ask how the eating disorder has come to protect the individual from being able to love and being able to feel. So think about that for a minute. You've got a young child who naturally is going to care about the parents, who's going to care about other people, who's going to be able to love. But what happens is when it's not reciprocated, then the child learns to close their heart in order to be able to protect themselves and be safe. 
And if you can get to the five-year-old or the seven-year-old or the nine-year-old and learn what it is that closed their hearts, then you can begin to find the doors to why it is that they turn to an object such as food or an object such as sex as a way of staying. And what you want to be able to do is open up their hearts to turn back to human beings again and to remove those big roadblocks that are in the way from being able to love and care for other people. So just to summarize, I know I've been talking a lot here, but there are two things. There's one which is something learnt, came in to close them, and we have to remove that big block. And two, then we have to learn to open. And oftentimes there's a whole process of learning how to be able to open themselves back up and slowly begin to trust and feel safe. Honestly, I think all human beings have learned to close their hearts because they've been hurt so badly along the way. And so for all people, what we have to do is learn how to be able to open up, and that process is really a critical one. Okay, so now let's turn to Sense8 Focus. I have this picture of these two lovers together. And many of you who have dealt with eating disorders have probably not been used to doing sex therapy, so this may seem a little overwhelming to you. But, you know, what we do is we have couples go home, take off their clothes, have some light on in the room, have a comfortable temperature, and to be able to be physically close to one another and not have sex. And in that, they begin to get and understand the, the joys of sensuality. Sensuality. And that's different than sexuality. Sensuality is touch. And it's as if the fingertips have to be tuned up again. Because when you have avoidant or type A type of attachment, your fingers become numb. And they don't seem to give you the capacity. So what looks like when you have avoidant attachment, oh, I don't enjoy sex very much, I don't enjoy touching very much. Remember, these are human capacities. All of us have that potential. And your job is to open up the human potential for the person to begin to re-experience the full sensuality of being close and touching. And so Sensate Focus is a vehicle to be able to do that. Just remember the capacity is there. You have to get the roadblocks out of the way. And oftentimes it's fear. And oftentimes it's, you know, the pain. Uh, and, you know, if you get too close, you're going to get killed. So oftentimes it's child parts that feel terrified of this in some ways and even have panic attacks. So we get what's called sexual aversion. Aversion is a phobic element to sex where when you're close to somebody, you almost feel like you want to throw up or you do throw up. You know, you have a full panic attack and a phobia. Exposure based. And it's very quickly uh, abated with adequate sex therapy. But you know, it's a dramatic presentation, but it's very easily cured. And really, the potential for this is, is easily opened up. But remember that you know, the eating disorder has come in as a way of protecting the individual and numbing them out and keeping them from being able to experience this sensual kind of joy and pleasure because it's been associated with terror and fear. But your job is to open that back up again so the person can re-experience passion with other the human beings. So since I focus then catalyzes the stuck points interfering with the natural manifestations of sexuality. And psychotherapy then focuses on dealing with those stuck points. And so by psychotherapy, what I mean here is beginning to invite the person back to being a human being again and to get back into the joys of loving and caring for other human beings. And to me, it's sort of like you know, beginning to introduce the person to the joys of what they're by being close. Okay, so what I now want to do is move from the slides and talking back about the eating disorder client and their partner. So we now, in a comprehensive model, have included the partner in the therapy. We have included the partner in the meal planning. We've included the partner in, with the dietitian. We've included the partner 
in the understanding the function and the purpose of the eating disorder. We've included the partner in the uh, being able to get back involved in physical closeness and intimacy. Now, oftentimes the partner is not accustomed to being loved fully. They got in this relationship because they were only able to tolerate a certain amount of emotional closeness themselves. So now you ask the question, well, what happens now if the partner begins to get scared? And I would say that maybe in nine out of ten cases that's true. If it's a new relationship, sometimes it's not. But oftentimes the partner has an equal amount of problem as the identified client, as you know, obviously true in systemic therapies. And so what's very best is for the partner begin to identify their own issues. For us, the most common presentation is a female client with anorexia or bulimia. For us, then, the partner, more often than not, is male and has some sort of oftentimes sexual addiction. Sometimes it's a same-sex relationship, and oftentimes in a same-sex relationship, um, the partner can have difficulties with not necessarily eating disorder, but disordered eating. So the two problems we see most often are disordered eating and sexual addiction among the partners that come in. And there are serious problems and really need to dealt with. If you send some, a client back home with a partner who has disordered eating, you know, it's only a matter of time to what's called the change back principle. The change back principle for every aspect of change there's an equal amount of energy to changing them back. You know, it's the proverbial where a person is trying to lose weight and their partner brings them, you know, candy for their birthday. And it's like, what message are they sending them? Terribly threatened by this. And so they're giving a lot of subtle cues to change back in some ways. So what you want to do is bring the partner on board and find out what their fears are of losing their partner. And, you know, what it usually is is self-esteem. And self-esteem that they feel like is, I'm a defective person, and the only reason this person chose me is because they have an eating disorder, and so they're equally defective. And so I'm defective, they're defective, and then we're congruent in some ways. So if the person loses their eating disorder, then all of a sudden the partner, who has a certain amount of shame, feels like, well, when the person realizes that they're not defective, they're not going to want to be around me. So it's so important to begin to deal with the shame issues of the partner and begin to bring the partner into the therapeutic relationship. More often than not, that means that the partner has to get some individual work themselves, and you want to get them an individual therapy, but you want to begin to work with that therapist because the symptoms may not be so salient and you want to begin to get at whatever the shame is that's underneath it in some ways. The most common presentation of my experience is that the partners had neglect in their life. And it's like I'm the fifth of five children, all the energy went to the other children, and I was the fifth and no one gave me much love, and so I'm not accustomed to getting much. And so the result of that is this avoidant style of attachment. So an avoidant finds an avoidant. And they get locked into that in some pathological way. So what you want to do is have the partner turn towards insecure attachment. So let's talk about how to be able to do that. I talked about self-cohesion earlier, and you said, well, OK, I get that. Well, how do you help a person deal with self-cohesion problems? That's the primary problem of the avoidance style for the identified client with the eating disorder. And it's the primary problem with the avoidance style of the partner with the eating disorder. So how does one deal with these self-cohesion problems is the question. The answer is, we tend to use internal family systems therapy. Why internal family systems therapy? Well, it's really another form of gestalt work, really. And in gestalt work, what you're doing is helping the person look at the disowned part of self, the child or self, which is the principal uh, key to being able to love another person. If you hate yourself, 
it's hard for you to get someone else to love you because it doesn't fit. I hate myself. This person loves me. That's not congruent. So to get a person to be able to love themselves is a prerequisite for a person to be able to be loved by another person. To get them to love themselves, what one has to do is find these disowned parts of self that are often saying shame bound and begin to get them to reconnect with those parts, form primary relationships, and be able to talk to them. So it might be something like this. Let's say put your seven-year-old part into an empty chair. And let's get a picture of what that part looked like when she was age seven. And let's say that part, you might have a photograph. It might have had that blue dress on. Or if it's a male partner, what it looked like when you were seven years old, how you begin to perceive yourself. And um, let's get to know that seven-year-old. What does she want to tell you about herself? What does he want to tell you about himself? What's he like? Just get a real feeling of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors of that part of self. This is where the affect work comes in most useful. You know, in good cognitive behavioral therapy, they've now included an affect component. So most good cognitive behavioral therapies also include this affective piece now. And this affective piece, you want to know how that seven-year-old feels. And in those feelings, you begin to get much more in touch with how to begin to talk to that seven-year-old and be the feelings that the seven-year-old has. And so to get the adult self to begin to form a real relationship with the seven-year-old, and really it becomes more reparenting. And so how to begin to adopt that seven-year-old and begin to listen to that seven-year-old and be able to identify with how that seven-year-old is feeling in some ways. I'll give an example from my own life. When I was age 12, my father died. And when he died, I went to his funeral, but I was unable to cry. So when I go back and I identify that 12-year-old inside me, it's, that 12-year-old's frozen, almost like at the funeral. And I've had to go in and just sort of hold him and thaw him out. And as that happens, then I'm able to get to a lot of the feelings of grief that I didn't experience back then. And it's a little scary. So as I'm holding that 12-year-old, I have to be able to tolerate the affect that's embedded in that. And as I'm able to do that, and that 12-year-old begins to share with me, there's this general characterological feeling of cohesiveness that comes in, because I'm able then to feel whole. I separated from that 12-year-old when I was a long ago. And as I'm able to embrace that 12-year-old, I actually feel more myself. And it feels really good. And it also feels a little scary. So as I've done that over the years, I felt more cohesive. And the result of that has been my whole personality began to change. I began to feel much more myself, is the way I would describe it. And I feel much more loving and caring towards others. So that's the kind of model I like to use with the client. All right, I see I'm getting towards the end of the hour. And so it's probably a good time for me to stop and take questions. So let's stop at this point and see if there's anybody who would like to ask some questions. All right, we do have one question, and they wanted to know if this work was effective with teenagers. Well, um, I'm talking about couples. And so... You know, mostly I'm talking about people who live together or are seeing each other. But, you know, I, I imagine that anybody who's got a partner who wants to help them with their eating disorder is going to be useful. In some ways, teenagers are more susceptible to influence. And so if you have a really healthy, good partner, I imagine that would be incredibly helpful in the process. But the truth is I don't, I've not worked a lot with teenagers um, in this way, so I'm not sure. And um, they were asking about, um, does it work with teenagers or clients who have been sexually abused and now have dysregulation issues around relationships? Yeah. Teenagers who have dysregulation around relationships, yeah, I think there you do a lot of anticipatory guidance because they often always get into one destructive relationship after another, and no matter what you tell them, they do it anyway. And so what you're doing is using their 
destructive choices as a way of teaching them what they need to learn. I mean, so much of what happens to me with the recovery process is that the person has not had the opportunity to learn from their mistakes because they, you know, what eating disorder at its core is, is avoidance. And so they've avoided a lot of the developmental tasks of other folks. Or when they do do it, they do it so destructively that it becomes another source of trauma or reenactment or repetition, which was equally bad. So what you want to be able to do is give them anticipatory guidance of what they need to learn at those developmental stance that they didn't, and if they made destructive choices, how to not repeat it. Let me thank you all for joining us, and if anybody um, has any individual questions, they can always call me, uh, and uh, my number is 314-378-6832. I'm very appreciative of you joining us. Thank you.